want to do God's will. What you're seeking is a blessing from God. You must expect a miracle. You have the power of choice. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Life Today Live. Well, here in the United States, it is Election Day, or as a uh, friend and radio host Mark Davis says, Ejection Day. <laughs> so we will see what happens uh, today and then see if it changes overnight and when they suddenly find lots of ballots like last time. Anyway, uh, that's not, we're, we're going to touch on some issues today. But my, my guest today is a successful businessman. Uh, a restaurateur, Middle Tennessee area. Uh, Peter Demas is his name. And so if you're from Murfreesboro, Hendersonville, a lot of those areas around the Nashville area, uh, you might know uh, uh, Demas, the, the restaurant. Uh, well, this is uh, the guy who's currently running uh, those. And, and so he, he's got a perspective that I think is important. And he's a Christian, which is obviously uh, important as well. He also has a new book out, and it is called on the Christian duty of civil disobedience. And that is, uh, that is a very interesting and deep topic. So we're going we're gonna to have a good conversation. You're invited to be a part of the conversation. Chat is open. If you're watching live, if you haven't subscribed, followed, liked, shared, please do all that. Peter, great to have you back on Life Today Live. I appreciate you having me back. I, I like the, like being on here. Thank you. <laughs> so so what, do you, what, do you, what are you looking for tonight? Uh, in, in the uh, election. What do you, what do you hope happens? Well, you know, ten, Tennessee, fortunately, you know, Tennessee, uh, the, 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 there's not a whole lot of, you know, the, pretty much all the polls here in Tennessee. So like, that we're not getting all the attention that everything else is happening mm -hmm. everywhere. But the big thing we're, I'm wanting to see is, is, you know, I'm wanting to see a, a, a group of people that can kind of come and kind of stop and, and recognize the craziness that's happening in our culture yeah. so we can at least stop encouraging it. I don't think that they can completely fix it or eliminate it. But, you know, when we when we look at the volume of unrighteousness and the and how it's encouraged, I at least think we ought to stop that part of the process first. And so as I look at these races that are occurring in, you know, like the governor's races in Michigan and Arizona or the, the Senate races in, in Georgia and Pennsylvania, you know, I'm, I'm looking at those and recognizing that. You know, we, we have a problem in our country and, and we, you know, unfortunately, you know, we actually get to say and in, in, in how it goes forward. And I'm just hoping that people will just go out and vote and recognize what's happening and send a message that this type of craziness is not welcome in our country anymore. Yeah, I, I know that we can't hold back the ocean entirely, but we can hopefully tonight put put a finger in, in the dike and, and stop some of the the flood water that's coming in is kind of threatening us. You know, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Um, <laughs> what do we do as Christians, as citizens of a country, uh, if the election doesn't go the way we want it to do, should we, should we break things? No, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> no, um, absolutely not. The thing we have to remember is this, is that we're called to be ambassadors for Christ. So it does not matter what happens to us. We're still ambassadors to Christ. We still have to engage in a way to share the gospel and make disciples. We want people to look at us and say, why are they different? And we want to add credibility to ourselves when we say we are different. Does that mean that we're perfect? Absolutely not. But we also want to use our imperfections. We want to use our emotions and our anger to be able to do so. But, but you know, the, the Jesus... When he when he appointed his apostles, I mean, see, it was Caesar Tiberius during that time who yeah. was a, a terrible human being. Yeah. I mean, as a, a child molester and and just a ruthless ruthless ruler. Yeah. And then Nero was not too far after that. You know, when when you know Paul was there, but they still engaged in behavior that represented and was able to grow. The grow Christianity in such a way, in spite of the fact that the leadership was probably not who they wanted or picked and put in place. Yeah, you know, I, I've wondered, and, and I've had the conversation with some theologians to put, shed some light on this. But you know, if you just read the simple text that says, "Obey all authorities; all authority is appointed by God," you could get the idea that even if you got a Nero in, in office, that 
we're supposed to do whatever they say. Uh, but yet, then the same guy that wrote that said we ought to obey God rather than men, you know, right. and proceeded to disobey the authorities that said stop preaching. How do you how do you deal with sort of that that tension in Scripture? Well, a couple things there, uh, you know, in in both in in, in Peter and in Romans, um, you know, where where both of them, Paul and Peter, both say, you know, we need to submit to authorities. There's a big difference between submitting to something and obeying something. You know, so so we need to submit to their rules. So when we disobey, we need to be willing to go to jail. We mm -hmm. need to be willing to have our business taken away. We need to submit in those areas. You know, the same reason why, and in Romans, the, the context um, was a little bit more about taxation, because right after that, he talks about, you know, hey, you got to pay your taxes. So we do submit um, in that area. We still pay our taxes, even if our taxes go to terrible things. So I think that's one area that we have to look at. But but uh, the word of God is there, and and it, it's there as a guide for us. And so you know, if we can't separate, we can't. I'm I'm a Christian regardless. I can't take Christ out of me in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. So when Christ tells me I need to preach the gospel, when you know, and, and or if the government tells me to commit evil. You know, to, to take a, a simple, you know, a simple point in history, you know, if, if I have if if the government is saying you got to kill Jews, you know, then then I, it's my duty to go out and protect them and save life. Mm -hmm. So I still think that 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 that's there. But Paul and Peter both reference the fact that the, the government is there to to help, you know, preserve what is right and, and punish those who are wrong. So, so whenever we look at our government in the sense that that's what they're supposed to be doing, at that point in time, that's where that that's what we have to understand is that our government is always not not always right, and our government isn't always there, and so we have to obey God rather than man. Well, yeah, and and <laughs> you, you referred to it in Bible times, but right now we have it. We have people all over the country who are are not punishing wrongdoers. And they're sure as heck not protecting life, if, especially if you look at life in the womb. Um, but, you know, they're not protecting the, the border the way they should. We've got massive drugs coming across the border. We don't know. We know some criminals have come across. Uh, you know, someone who was illegally here just hit Paul Pelosi in the head with a hammer. You know, uh, so we, we, you could easily look at the government right now in our country and say that they are not doing what they're supposed to do, according even to the Constitution, but certainly not according to the Bible. Therefore, and that's, that's I think, the tough part. Therefore, how do I respond as a Christian? Do, how do I show my displeasure? Is it simply by voting? What do I uh, submit to? I have heard the argument, theological argument, that if a, a an authority figure is not in following God's order, if they're wrong, that we don't then submit to it. We don't recognize them as authority, which is, I, 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 it's a little bit, it's tough to read the plain text like that and come away with that, but yet it feels right. Does that make sense? So I guess my question is, when the government is clearly wrong, um, what, what do we do? Well, I think I think recognizing it. I think there's two questions you have there. First of all, I, I I strongly disagree. I think we still have to recognize it because Jesus tells us, "Render under Caesar what is Caesar's." Okay. So he's still recognizing the authority of Caesar, even though, even though he was crucified for not recognizing the authority of Caesar. I mean, that was, <laughs> you know. So, but but he did, but he did, uh, but he did say, "Look, you know, what what is Caesar's is Caesar's. What is the God's is God's." So I think that's one part. The second thing is when you asked what to do, it was it was interesting. But when 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 the gov or the then governor of New York was advocating not only you know abortions all the way up until the day before birth, but also said you know what we want to have abortions even afterward, kind of like what they're doing in Prop One in California right now. Right. And my son was really upset. He goes, "What do we do?" And I'm like, "You know, we don't want to add to the noise. You know, posting on Facebook, no one cares. You know, it's really not going to care at all." You know, and people think that's all. Oh, look, I'm involved, and no, you're not. You're just, you're just, you're just creating noise. And so I, I really debated on what to do. We were actually about to take a trip up to New York, and I'm like, do we boycott it? Do we do that? I mean, yeah. th are they yeah. going to really know that I didn't spend my thousand dollars in New York, you yeah. know, or however much we were spending there? 
And then I realized it finally hit me. God's plan is perfect, but we our government is a relation, or especially in the U.S., is is a reflection upon the people. We're the ones that put them in, and so as a result, we have to change our culture first. Hmm. We got to get our country to know the true God. In Second Chronicles fifteen, you know, it, it, in, in verses three through six, it says, "You know, it, it, Israel didn't know a true God, and then, so God created all these problems." Well, if God created these problems, an elected official is not going to fix it. You know, so sure. we have to change and get to know a true God first. Once we know the true God, then our politicians will start to change and we'll start to move from there. Now, I do think we can bring in politicians that can help us get to know a true God. I do think that's possible. But but as far as what I'm what I'm doing and you're doing and others, I think teaching people who Christ is and and sharing that message, I think is so important to 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 trans to 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 transform our government and how it works from there. Yeah, to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, uh, the the most practical political act that a Christian can can do is to reach his neighbor with the gospel. It, it, it really is the way to, to change a culture. At the same time, and again, this is, this is a tension, I recognize this, and so we'll, we'll have this discussion about how to handle it, and, and, and it's a good discussion to have, and I'm not necessarily advocating one thing over another or one position over another, just in case you're wondering. I'm, I'm actually talking through it with, with Peter today um, and with anybody on chat. And by the way, someone who's watching right now brings up a great point. You got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The, yes. the authority says when you hear the trumpet, you're going to bow. What did they do? They stood, you know, and, yeah. and that's one of our cornerstone stories. Um, and right now, the, the government is, is, you know, playing some trumpets that Christians are going, I can't bow to that. Yeah, I, you know, I agree. And, and you see it all throughout the Bible. You know, you have, you know, even the midwives with Pharaoh, that was like, oh, well, no, nope, sorry, I know I was supposed to kill the, that newborn baby, right. but they got here first, you know, and, uh, you know, in, 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 in my book, I talk about a lot of these examples, Daniel, not only not only in the book of Daniel with, with, with you know, with the, the, the fire, but also with the, the, you know, getting thrown in the lion's den, you know, you're not allowed to pray, what does he do? He opens up the window and does what he always does. <laughs> he didn't intentionally go after them, he just did what he what he knows that he was supposed to do as, you know, as a believer. You know, um, and then you go all the way up to Paul and Jesus and Peter. You know, here's the thing. If John the Baptist did not, if he just obeyed and did everything, he would have lived a really long, healthy life. You know, but because he spoke out for, he spoke out for, you know, against unrighteousness, he got beheaded for it. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and you look at the, all the apostles, you know, the only one that didn't die miserably was John. And I would think that he probably wasn't really, you know, happy on Patmos during that time, you know, so they, they, they underwent so much persecution because they just said, look, this is, this is who we believe in. And, and this is why we do what we do. I think Christians in America in particular, and I would say, say a lot in Canada as well, you, you, we, we're too, we're too scared to speak out. I think our first step is to speak. And just say no. I'm a Christian, and and yeah, you know what? You might not like me because of it, but that's okay. I'm a Christian, and we got to get past that. I might not get invited to the next Christmas party because everyone's going to get drunk there, and people are going to be like, "Oh, you're a Christian. You don't believe in that type of stuff, so we, you can't come and celebrate birth, Christ's birth with us." You know, I mean, okay, you don't get invited to the Christmas party. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> well, you know, yeah. get, get over yourself. Yeah, well, I hear you, and, and if we're going to take a stand, we need to be willing to pay the price. Uh, I have a couple of very difficult questions for you. Just, just, and okay. since you wrote the book, I'll show people the book, On the Christian Duty of Civil Disobedience by Peter uh, Demas. Uh, you, you get the hard questions. Um, okay. And I, and I kind of I think I hear you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, but are you, are you suggesting that maybe we should just disobey when the government tells us to do something wrong with any authority who tells us to do something that is against Scripture? but not go out of our way to, I don't know, to protest it or make a show of it? Are, are you saying that we should sort of just quietly disobey? Is that is that a suggestion that might be here? No. I th well, I think for some people, yes, I think that's appropriate. And I think for others, you have to do more. So I'll give you, there's, there's a three-part test in there, which is you need to disobey if the government's asking you to commit evil. 
If the government's asking you to commit evil, you have to say no. You know, um, if the government is asking you to do something that's against God's word, like preaching the gospel, you know, if they say you can't preach the gospel in your workplace, I'm going to have to say, I'm going to have to say that. Another example, if the government said, I have to use pronouns, you know, that people want, I'm going to have to say, no, I'll call you whatever name you want me to call you. You know, if you want to be, you know, if, if, if you want to be Joseph to Josephine, I'll call you Josephine because you get to pick your own name, but I don't, you don't get to pick your pronoun. God does that. So I can't say that. The third one is, is if the Holy Spirit asks you to get involved, I think that's where it changes. So it could be somebody like Amy Carmichael who went and, and worked in getting rid of sex trafficking, yeah. you know, or not, not get rid of it. Obviously, she didn't do that, but to 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 make an impact in those areas. So I think a lot of it is going to depend on where the Holy Spirit leads you in that circumstance. But I don't think it's a situation because, frankly, there's so much unrighteousness going on. I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to leave Walmart without protesting everything I do. Right. You know, I mean, right. you know, so, so, you know, all these companies that are out there, these woke companies that I can't. So I think a lot of it is, is we have to spend time in prayer to figure out where does God want us involved in each circumstance? Because there's a whole lot that if I wanted to, I mean, I could speak out against and some things I have to have some discernment and let the Holy Spirit guide me of, do I get involved in this area or do I get involved in this area? But I can't get involved with both or I'd be very ineffective in both areas. Yeah. And, and there is a point where, like you say, you just do become noise. If you complain about everything, you just yes. come across as a complainer. And I don't, I, I, I don't think that, like you say, I don't think it's effective. Um, okay. Are you ready for the really hard question? Certainly. <laughs> this is a hard one. So you, you referenced the midwives uh, okay. um, with Moses, and they not only disobeyed the government, um, they deceived him, you know? Oh, right. I just found, just this baby was just found. It's like, yeah, okay, she was, Miriam was watching, right? And there's another instance, in, and I, I should have looked this up before, but maybe you know who it is. Somebody in the Old Testament was dragged into court uh, or before the, the king, the pharaoh, whatever, and he feigned insanity, foaming at the mouth. David, yeah. Was it? It was David. See, I was thinking yeah, it was David, David. Yeah, David feigned insanity, and Abraham lied and said, this is my sister. Yeah. Oh, okay. There's another great example. Yeah. <laughs> is it okay to deceive an unrighteous government for the sake of the gospel? I mean, and that's a weird, hard question. I don't think it is. I, I understand. I understand where people might have some heartburn with that, but I don't think it is. I, to me, Rahab is the best example there, you know, because they were coming and being like, "Hey, who are the spies you have hidden?" She's like, "Oh, they're not here," and she hid them, you know. I, and and she is in the book of faith. Abraham lied. He's in the he's in the hall of fame of faith. Yeah. You know, you know, David, a man after his own heart, in the hall of fame. So the people that you're mentioning, you know, with with the exception of the midwives, were deceivers of some level, right? Um, and so I don't think that um, I don't think it's necessarily there because again, and and I, where I do think it becomes tricky is: am I deceiving for my personal benefit, or am I deceiving for the the advancement of the gospel or what God has asked to do? And I do think sometimes we have to be able to 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 lie about. It. Here's an example: if if someone came in, you know, someone came in to, to, to the building that I'm in right now, and I'm, I'm in a, I'm, I, I'm, uh, have a conference downstairs, and they, they go to that conference, and they're like, and they have a gun, and they're like, we want to know where Peter is, and we want to go kill him. I really hope that they sit there and say, oh, well, he's not upstairs in this little room. <laughs> right, right, oh, right. they're like, he's not here. <laughs> go check down the street, you know? Yeah. I mean, I want them to look and look at him and lie. You know, and I think everybody who's listening would sit there and say, as a benefit of that, I think it's appropriate. The same way that, that again, taking more modern more modern times, um, well, I guess it's getting further and further from modern times. But the you know the Nazis and the Christians that hid the Jews, yeah, and they lied or they they hid the Jews yeah. as 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 Aryans. I think those are good examples of where I think it is extremely appropriate to do so, and I think that's where that's where. But but again. God's leading us through this process and we're still having to take part of it. Now, does he need us? You know, no, he could find somebody else, you know, so if we don't lie, but I don't think there's anything that's completely unbiblical in those circumstances at all, because again, we are doing the, we, we are abiding by the word of God. And I don't know of any other law that's higher than that. Yeah. And, and I think the personal gain is, is a strong consideration um, because I, I, 
I shouldn't lie on my taxes just I, because I don't want the government giving more money to Planned Parenthood, even though I don't want the money give, the government giving more money to Planned Parenthood. That doesn't necessarily mean that I can cheat on my taxes. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, you're exactly 100% correct. Uh, and, and because then you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping money. Mm. You, and I think there you're, you're making, you're, you're creating idols. And at that point in time, when you start serving the idol, for lying if you're lying to serve your idol i think that's where part of that difference is that's and great. we can justify it the same way that the patriots and i call them the patriots back in the back in the 90s did you know when they were like oh well you have no authority over me it was the the uh the freemen of of you know out west and you know and there's many other militias that are out there now right. they're similar it's the same thing as that they're 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 worshiping something that's not god mm. That's a good even point. if even if you agree with them, you still have to say, well, nope, you still got to you still got to do that from there. You know, I think that's another piece of it, which is I might be able to agree that the, the government money should not go to Planned Parenthood, but I still I have still have a duty to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And that, that that's that's a little tough. I mean, it, it, yeah, that, it, it, it's hard. I think some of it is that we have to not feel like we're the ones that have to set everything straight. God's the ultimate judge and order, the one whose justice is the highest, not mine. Right. Yeah, I think we put so much burden on ourselves anyway. Even, even when it comes to sharing the gospel, we think that the reason why we don't want to share is because you know we may not have all the answers and we don't want to convert. You know, We, we think we're going to fail if we don't convert people. We win every time we share the gospel, mm -hmm. whether we share the gospel through civil disobedience or we share it just by talking to your neighbor or your your the person at work. Sure. We win then. Yeah. We don't win because they get converted. That's not our job. You're right. God's it's God's job to do justice, you know. But but we're just supposed to do our part that He asks us to do. And I think that leads to the next really important part. We don't spend as Americans, we don't spend enough time just listening to God, spending time reading the Bible, mm -hmm. spending time spending, you know, reading and understanding and how it works in our lives and having that 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 conversation, not just me just kind of blabbling on of what I want, you know, to do that. You know, even if it comes for praying for, you know, praying for our leaders in that way. I mean, imagine, imagine how wonderful it'd be if Governor Newsom had a Paul like experience. Oh gosh. I mean, I mean, it would just, it would change our country overnight almost, you know, I mean, but, but so we need to pray for Governor Newsom of, of a Paul-like experience, but I think instead we need to pray also that God just handles Governor Newsom the way he wants to handle him, you know, and, and, and like, let him, let him do that. But instead of just constantly praying, oh, we need to get him out and I pray for this and I, you know, that, that Governor Newsom will get, get recalled and out to, you know, out of office. Yeah. Let's pray that he has a Paul like experience. Let's pray that God will just deal with him the way that he needs to be dealt with in God's eyes. But yeah, and you're right. That would be huge. Um, I, I, I personally am praying that, that, uh, president Biden's brain would have a Lazarus experience. So uh, <laughs> you don't, you don't, you don't have to endorse that. Sorry. Some, sometimes I, I, you know, so my, my wife is, says, keep those thoughts in your head. And she's probably right. <laughs> okay. Last thing I have to ask you about this, because as, as a businessman, you, you, you hire people, you, you know, you have to do payroll, uh, you have to do insurance, you have to watch your margins, you have to deal with supply chain issues. I mean, these are all day to day tasks. Um, what are the important things? To, to you, because you're, you're kind of the quintessential American, uh, you know, small, you know, small business growing into a bigger business, business guy, you're, you're, you're the, the bread and butter of our country. Um, what are the big issues for you in, in today's election? Well, labor, labor is number one. And, and I can say labor for this reason, because right now everybody is short staffed. And until we can, and, until we can fix the labor, then 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 everything else is going to be there because the supply chain problem is is a good chunk of it is, is because of labor. You know, we we took a, a year to get a fryer in um, it, that, that we didn't have. And the reason why they couldn't get the fryer is because they couldn't get certain parts in both of it in both spots is because they didn't have the labor necessarily to do it. Then you have the labor of the truck drivers. Then you have the labor of. So I think it all starts with labor on it. 
And I think there's only three solutions. We have to increase labor, you know, through immigration. Yeah, uh, we can increase labor through, you know, through programs like work release programs from jail or or co-op programs in schools. Or we're going to have to close businesses and increase labor that way, and and end some of some of this that's happening. So I think labor is where it starts, and once that happens, once we start in seeing an increase of labor, we'll start seeing some of the problem. Interesting. I just heard a fact that that the the workforce, some of the workforce that we have now, we aborted a third of our workforce over the last ten years, and you know it's something I never really considered before. But you know these people that 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 could be in the workforce that never made it. You know, so so ultimately, all this is kind of playing into the role of, of you know, of what we're doing. Yeah, it, I heard that literally today. So it's it's incredible to when you think about it. So I think that's part of it. I think the second piece of it is, is we need to stop giving money away. I mean, okay. yeah, and, and that well, I mean, no, and that's that's, that's why I want, wanted to ask you because here's what I understand. Over, like I've heard. Anywhere from four and a half to five and a half million people have come across the border illegally since uh, Biden took office. And I know because I live in Texas, I've seen this my whole life. The vast majority of them come here to work and they work right. harder than people that live here. That's just that's the way it's always been because they they want the opportunity to work. I'm looking, I'm going, if, if millions of people have come across the border, the vast majority wanting to work. Why do we have a labor shortage? Is it because we're paying too many people to not work? I don't, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know if there's that. I don't know. Now I do know that, you know, the baby boomers are retiring and they're, and they're obviously, there's a huge population drop off to the next one. So I know that plays into it. Okay. I know that the, you know, being able to work from home and, and I know that plays into it. There's more people, more entrepreneurs out there that are not workers that are trying to be business owners that so, so I know that plays into it. I think there's a whole lot of factors that go into it, but I ask the same question you do. If all these people are coming, where are they? Yeah, I don't, you know, and, and now, I mean, I, I, outside of what, you know, we're hanging around those towns. But even then, my my grandfather, I, I'm always kind of funny with illegal immigration because my grandfather came here illegally. Um, his <laughs> brothers didn't, you know. But 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 you know. But I'm a benefit of illegal immigration. <laughs> right. And um, but at the same time, you know, he got here. He hooked up with his brothers. He worked. He ended up being the last one. His brothers all end up end up dying first, and he was the one that ran the business. He, you know, my, my, he, he raised my father in, in the work world. He raised my cousins in the work world, mm. work, work world and taught them that work ethic and, and created a lot of productive uh, members of society from it. And that, cha- that, that, that tree has continued to go down mm. in, in all sides of us. So, <clears throat> so I do know that there's a benefit to it, but he came here knowing that he just can't get here and just kind of be like, Oh, I landed in Virginia. What am I going to do now? Yeah. Huh. Pay me. You know, I mean, you know, and, and he didn't speak a lick of English and found a way of getting from Virginia to Birmingham, Alabama to 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 I mean he did that on his own with not one word of English. Well, so what yeah. I'm what I'm hearing is maybe we have a work ethic problem in this country. It could be, and it could, could be, be that some of these people that are coming here, and I, I definitely believe that. I mean, it's incredible to me listening to people be like, I'm just so stressed at work. I work so many hours. Well, how many hours you work? Oh, like 30 hours a week. <laughs> and I'm like, if I work 30 hours a week, my wife and I would get a divorce. I mean, like we couldn't, <laughs> I would drive her so insane. <laughs> I, it would be awful. I mean, I, I, I don't know what I would do with myself with 30 hours worth of work. I mean, I work as a, I, I'm an adjunct professor. I coach soccer. I, I operate two businesses. I, you know, I, I don't know what I would do with myself if I didn't work that. And people are all stressed about not working or working. And we need to create the stress of if you don't work, this is when the stress needs to be there. And I know it sounds really harsh, but that's the reality of it. If, if yeah. we don't, if you don't have to, then we don't. And it's not just the, also the employee, the, the non-workers getting money. It's also the government, the, the employers, that's just getting free money. You know, every time I turn around, I get an email saying, oh, you can get money from the government this way. You can get money from the government this way. And I'm like, you know, why would I want to try if I can make more money off my government than I can off my customers? Yeah. Why do I want to be better? Yeah. I think, you know, if, if you look at this properly, Peter, if you if you had more time, if you didn't work so hard, you, you could spend more time on Twitter and, and Facebook and Instagram. Uh, so well, I get my feelings hurt a lot more from all those people. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, I know I gotta let you go. Uh, if you haven't voted, get out and vote today. Uh, last word from you, Peter Demas, uh, on the uh, Christian duty of civil disobedience. What what's what's your parting thought for the day? I, again, uh, go out, go to the polls, but be informed first. Okay. No, if, if if yeah, don't go to the polls and then start reading what's on the ballot. Know what it says before you go there and be engaged and use your voice. Use your voice. That's our job as Christians. Faith comes by hearing. We got to start there. Yep, that's good. Oh, I need to show people your website. This is uh, peterdemas.org. Uh, so you can see what he's doing with business and faith. Uh, and there's probably a link to the book, but in case you don't have it, there's the book right there. You can get it wherever you get books. Peter, I, I appreciate you being here, spending your time with us. And uh, Thank if you, you so much. If you haven't voted, I expect you to go straight from here to the voting booth. So. <laughs> Appreciate all you guys out there watching for my Canadian friends. We're done after today. Talk about straight scriptural things. Got actors from The Chosen here on Friday, so it's going to be a good week. Appreciate you being here. We'll see you again next time here on Life Today Live.